This lesson is entitled Limit of a Function and Limit Laws. It's in this lesson where we begin to develop an informal definition of the limit of a function. We'll, we'll get a more precise uh, definition of a limit in, um, uh, in another lesson. So here, what we want to do is we want to look at a function. Uh, I'm going to give you, let's start with a rational function. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider how is the function behaving near a particular value. So here's the function I want us to consider. So the function is f of x is equal to x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. So this is a rational function. Now, the question is, how does this function behave um, as x gets closer and closer to 1? Now, you can see that this function is clearly, it's undefined at x equal to 1 because if x is equal to 1, you get 1 minus 1 down here in the denominator. You end up dividing by 0, which is undefined. We cannot divide by 0. So this function is defined for any real number except x equal to 1. So we cannot just simply plug 1 in or evaluate our function at 1. Um, but what we can do is we can simplify this function. So the numerator is a difference of two squares, and so it factors as x plus 1 times x minus 1. Um, so we see a common, excuse me, let me, there. We do see a common factor that divides out, namely x minus 1. And so this rational function simplifies to x plus 1, which is linear. Right, So this is true as long as x is not equal to 1. Okay, So we know the graph of x plus 1 is a diagonal line whose slope is 1 and whose y-intercept is positive 1. Um, the only thing is um, there's going to be a hole in our graph where x is 1, there is a hole. Notice that when x is 1, y is 2, right? 1 plus 1 is 2. So at the point 1 comma 2, there's a point that's removed or a hole in the graph. So this is what the graph would look like. It's a, it's a line um, going right through the y-intercept of 1 um, on the y-axis, and the, the point 1, 2 is removed. There's a hole here. This is the point at which the function is undefined. Okay, now let's answer the question. The question is, how does the function behave near x equal to 1? So now what we do is we consider x values approaching 1 from the left, and we ask ourselves, as x values approach 1 from the left, your function values are doing what? Well, as x gets closer and closer to 1 from the left, your function values are approaching 2. As x values approach 1 from the right, the function values are approaching 2. So to answer the question, the function values are, well, they're getting closer and closer to 2. Now, um, we know that at the point 1, 2, the function is undefined, but you know that we can make the values of f of x as close as we want to 2, right? We can make these function values here as close as we want to, cho but to 2 by choosing x close enough to 1. As long as you choose a value for x that's really close to 1 on either side of 1, then you are guaranteed that your function value will be close to 2. So here is our informal definition of a limit, of the limit of a function. So suppose that you have a function and it's defined on an open interval about c. Okay. Now our c value in this example would be 1. Okay. So if this function is defined um, about 1. Now, the defi our informal definition says, except possibly at C itself. So this function is actually not defined at C or at 1 itself, but it is defined around 1. If your function values, if, if f of x is arbitrarily close to the number L, now the number L here would be 2, 
okay? So your function values are getting arbitrarily close to 2. As close to L, or as close to 2 as we like, for all x sufficiently close to C, right? As x values are getting closer and closer and closer to 1, your function values are getting arbitrarily close to 2. Um, then we say that f approaches the limit L, which again is, uh, in this example, is 2. As x approaches C, as x approaches 1. And this is how we write it. Um, and this, this is read the limit of our function, the limit of f of x, as x approaches c is l. So this is our informal definition for the limit of a function. Your function values are approaching some real number called l as x values get closer and closer to some number c. So like in this example, once again, uh, your function values are getting very close to, as close as you want, to 2, this real number 2, as x values get closer and closer to 1. So we would say the limit of this function, this rational function, as x approaches 1 is 2. And this is how we would write it. Um, you can also write it um, with the actual, you know, um, the, the function, how it's written, right? x squared over 1 excuse me, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, the limit of that function as x approaches 1 is equal to 2. What I would like to highlight right now is how the limit of this function actually exists. The limit as x approaches 1 exists. It's 2. The limit of this function exists as x approaches 1, although the function is not defined at x equal to 1. So we do not need the function that we're considering to be defined at this c value in order for the limit to exist. Now, we, I keep saying that this is the informal definition, and it's just because this phrasing, uh, where is it here? Right here, arbitrarily close. Like, what does that really mean? Like, how close are we talking? You know what I mean? Um, for all x sufficiently close to c, again, that's really imprecise. And so um, in a further lesson, we will give a more precise, more robust uh, definition for a limit. For now, this will do. For our next example, I want you to consider, please, these three different functions. And I want you to consider what the limit is for each function as x approaches 1. Now this first function f is a rational function. It's the same one we just finished looking at. It has a hole here. Um, so this function is undefined. f is undefined at x equal to 1. This second function here, g, is a piecewise defined function. This function is defined at x equal to 1. And uh, the last one, h, here is a linear function. So we have a rational function, a piecewise defined function, and a linear function. Um, now, uh, we just looked at this function here, the rational function. We just finished doing that together. And so we can say the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 is equal to 2. And again, that reasoning is as x values get closer and closer to 1 from both sides of 1, the function values are approaching 2. Um, the same is true here, folks, as x values get closer and closer to 1 from both sides. Um, the function values here, I can, I can draw this in for us if it helps. The func as x values get closer and closer to 1, let me redo that. As x values get closer and closer to 1 from both sides of 1, of course, the function values are approaching 2. Now, I know that g of 1 is 1, but as x values get closer to 1, the function values are getting really close to 2, okay? So we say the limit of g of x as x values approach 1 is also 2. 
finally, this last one um, is probably straightforward here because it's a linear function. You know, the limit of h of x as x approaches 1 is equal to 2 as well. Um, again, the reason is because as x values get closer and closer to 1 from both sides of 1, the function values are approaching 2. So what I would like to highlight is the limit for all of these functions is the same. The function f, g, and h, the limit for all of these functions um, as x approaches 1 is 2. However, h is the only function right, where the limit as x approaches 1 is actually equal to h of 1, right? Look at h of 1 is 2, and 2 is actually li the limit as x approaches 1. So h is the only function that has like this equality of limit and function value, right? The function value at 1 is 2, and the limit as x approaches 1 is 2. So there's equality of limit and function value for h. Whereas over here, the limit of f as x approaches 1 is 2. At 1, though, the function value is undefined. Over here, the limit is 2, but the function value at 1 is 1. So the limit does not equal to the function value. h is the only one where that happens. We'll talk more about this later on, but this is how we are going to define the notion of continuity. How, what do we mean when a function is continuous? It has to do with the equality of limit and function values like h. The next thing we want to look at is um, finding the limit of, um, an, of the identity function and a constant function as x approaches some value c. Let's look at a, uh, at a picture, and I think a picture will be sufficient for us to make a conclusion. Here is the identity function. Remember the identity function is, here I can write it down for us, it is f of x or y is equal to x. Okay, y is equal to x or f of x is equal to x. Um, for any point that's on um, this, the graph of this function, the x and y coordinates are the same. So this is um, the point at which the coordinates are c comma c. You know, points that live on this uh, graph are like 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, negative 1, negative 1, and so forth. It's the identity function. It's a line whose slope is 1 that and that goes right through the origin. Okay, so this is the identity function. Now, the question is, what is the limit of an identity function as x values approach c? So as x values get closer and closer to c from both sides of c, your function values are approaching c as well. And that will be true regardless of what c is. Remember, the domain of this function is all real numbers. So no matter what real number we let c be, as x values get arbitrarily close to c, your function values are getting arbitrarily close to c as well. For this reason, we say the limit of this identity function, right, um, as x values approach some number c is equal to c. That is to say, the limit of x, the identity function, as x values approach c is c. All right, let's look at the constant function. Now here's the constant function y equal or f of x equal to some constant k. No matter what value you plug into this function, um, the output, the function value will always be the same and that's why it's called the constant function. It's always constant and it is some number k. All right, so what is the limit of this constant function as x values approach c from both sides of c, your function values are approaching k. Of course, because the function values will always be k. Your function values, no matter what, no matter what value your x values are approaching, your function values will always be k. So for this reason, we would say the limit 
of this constant function, which I named f, um, as x approaches c is equal to k. In other words, the limit of k as x approaches c is equal to k. The function values never change. The function values never change. So this is what the limit is. So these are very two important limits, okay? You may want to keep them handy in your notes and um, remember them. Okay, we want to talk about limits and how sometimes they fail to exist. So I have a few functions that I want us to look at that illustrate how a limit may not exist. So I have three functions for us to look at. So here's the first of the three. Each of these functions, we're going to find the limit does not exist, and it'll be for um, different reasons, okay? So notice um, how although the limit does not exist for each of these functions that I'm about to show you, please note the reason they do not exist, okay? The reason for the limit um, not existing. Okay, the first function that we are looking at is called the unit step function. Here, I'll write that down for us. Uh, this is going to be the unit step function. I think once we look at the graph, you can understand um, why it's called the step function or the unit step function. So let's get the graph um, of this function. Actually, I would actually invite you to pause the video here, pause the lesson, and actually graph this function um, for yourself, and then play the lesson again, and let's see if you and I have a graph that um, is the same. All right, so give it a shot on your own first. Go ahead and pause the lesson here. Okay, hopefully you and I agree at um, on, on how this graph looks. So um, u of x, this unit step function says that your function values are zero. So your function lies right on the x-axis whenever x is less than zero. So that's what we have. And it's strictly less than zero, so you should have an open circle here. And then the, the function values are actually equal to one um, for x values that are greater than or equal to zero. So you have a closed circle there. All right, so the question is, what is the limit of this function as x values approach zero? So watch this. As x values approach zero from the left, the function values are approaching zero. But as x values approach zero from the right, I should, I'm sorry, hold on. As x values approach zero from the right, your function values are approaching one. So from one side of zero, your function values are approaching zero. On the other side of zero, your function values are approaching one. So the limit does not exist because from the left of zero, the limit is zero. But from the right of zero, the limit is one. There is no single value L approached by this unit step function as x approaches zero, okay? So for this reason, we're gonna say, this is our final answer, the limit um, as, the limit of uh, this function as x approaches zero does not exist, okay? That's our final response. Okay, cool. Let's look at another function, and let's we're going to see again the limit does not exist, but it'll be for a different reason. All right, let's go. Okay, so here we have a um, function named g here, and um, I would invite you again to pause the lesson and to generate the graph for this function. And then let's see if you and I agree. Let's see if our pictures are the same. So go ahead and pause the lesson here. Okay, hopefully our graphs look the same. All right, so um, 1 over x is, is our most basic rational function or uh, reciprocal function. Um, so we know the graph looks like this. Um, for this function, of course, it's not defined at x equal to 0. 
uh, just for 1 over x, I'm talking um, about just this piece here because you can't divide by 0. So make sure these curves never touch the y-axis. Um, but this uh, piecewise defined function is defined at x equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, your function value is 0. In other words, you have this point at the origin. Okay. Now, you and I are considering the limit of this function g as x values approach 0. Okay, so as x values approach 0 from the left, your function values tend to negative infinity. Um, as x values approach 0 from the right, your function values are approaching positive infinity. Your function values grow arbitrarily large in absolute value. So we can say the function grows too large, if you will, to have a limit. Remember, the limit has to be some real number that your function values are approaching. Infinity, neither infinity nor negative infinity are real numbers. So your function values are not approaching a real number. The function values are growing too large for that to happen in an absolute value. The values of g grow arbitrarily large in, arbitrarily large in absolute value. We say the function is not bounded because the function values keep on increasing without bound or decreasing without bound. For this reason, we're going to say the function for the, the, the excuse me, the limit of g of x as x approaches zero does not exist. Sometimes I write it like this. The limit of g of x as x approaches zero is, uh, does not exist. And um, I welcome you to, or invite you to use the same notation if you'd like. Okay, um, so once again, a limit does not exist. This reason was different than the previous, okay? Now let's look at one more function. Let's look at another function whose limit does not exist as x approaches zero, and it will be for a different reason. Okay, this will be the last function we look at um, within the context of limits failing to exist. So this is a piecewise defined function. So you have um, a constant function to the left of zero, right? F of x is equal to just zero. So you have a function that is just basically right on the x-axis uh, for x values that are less than or equal to zero. And then to the right of zero, you have sine of one over x. Um, if you would like, um, you can use a table to graph this or desmos.com or uh, maybe you know what the graph of, look, of this looks like. Um, but go ahead and pause the lesson one more time and generate the graph for this function f. And then let's see if you and I have uh, the same graph. Okay, to the left of zero, less than or equal to zero, you are right on the x-axis, right? Your function values are zero. But to the right of zero, it's sine of one over x. And what ends up happening is your function oscillates um, between negative one and one. And actually probably a lot closer. Oh, that's pretty sloppy. But um, I think you understand the idea. Um, the function um, never really arrives at any... Uh, value, any single value to the right of zero. It oscillates too much to have a limit, okay? Um, so for this reason, uh, we say the limit does not exist as x values approach zero, of course. So I will choose to write the limit of this function f of x as x approaches zero does not exist. Again, it's because these function values are at 1, then negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, oscillates too much. It, the function values are not approaching a single value because of that oscillating behavior, up, down, up, down, up, down. All right, great. So this kind of summarizes three different cases where a limit may not, a, uh, may not exist. Okay, we're going to have a list of rules or laws that are going to help us break down otherwise complicated functions into simple ones 
um, so that we can calculate limits. So we have the sum rule, difference rule, constant multiple rule, the product rule, quotient rule, power rule, and the root rule. Let me quickly help us read through these rules, through these laws, and then we'll look at a few examples that illustrate or show how these rules can be used. All right, first we define L, M, and C to be real numbers. And also we say the limit of a function F as X approaches C is L, and the limit of another function G as X approaches C is M, okay? The first rule is the sum rule which says the limit of the sum of our two functions is equal to the sum of the limits, okay? The limit of the sum of the, our two functions is equivalent to the sum of the limits. So basically the limit of f of x plus the limit of g of x. That is to say, L plus M. The same can be said about the difference of two functions. The limit of the difference of two functions is equivalent to the difference of the limits. That is to say, um, the limit of f of x minus g of x is equal to the limit of f of x minus the limit of g of x, L minus M. The next two rules are the constant multiple rule and the product rule. The constant multiple rule says that if you're evaluating the limit of the product of your function and a constant, that's equivalent to the constant times the limit of your function. In other words, you can, in essence, pull this k out, right, out in front of the limit, and it's equivalent to k times the limit of f of x. The product rule behaves exactly as you would probably expect it to. Um, the limit of the product of our two functions is equivalent to the product of our limits. Okay, so the limit of f of x times g of x is equal to the limit of f of x times the limit of g of x. The next two rules are the quotient rule and power rule. And um, again, I, th I think they behave as you would expect them to. The limit of the quotient of our two functions is equivalent to the quotient of the limits. Here you just have to be really careful, and you're going to see this in, in the next example. Um, you have to make sure that the limit of g of x is not zero, um, because we can't divide by zero. Uh, the power rule says the limit of the power of our function is equivalent to the power of the limit. Here, the power n here represents some positive integer, okay? One more rule to go through, and then we can do some more examples, is the root rule. The root, the root rule says the limit of the nth root of f of x is equal to the nth root of our limit. Um, of course, you can use a rational exponent to represent that nth root if you want. Again, n represents a positive integer, okay? Now, one thing is um, you have to be careful about here is if n is even, that means you're finding an even root, right? So if n is even, we have to make sure that f of x is positive, okay? Um, it's positive because if you take an, if you try to find an even root, of a negative radicand that will introduce imaginary solutions. So if n is even, let's make sure that f of x is positive, okay? All right, find the following limits. So I'm gonna give you a function. Um, we're gonna do like three different functions or so, and we're gonna find the limit. The first function I'm giving you is a cubic trinomial. It's a polynomial function. And we're finding the limit, and this, it's important that we understand that this is a polynomial function because the conclusion that we will um, arrive at, um, in the end, it will be very, very, very important. So just keep in mind, we're finding the limit of a polynomial function. All right, so let's use our laws to figure this out, all right? Let's go for it. The first um, law that I think we should use is the sum law or the sum rule. I think I'll say law, okay? 
So the sum law says that I can find the limit of this polynomial function by evaluating the limit of each term, right? So the limit um, of just x cubed plus the limit of 4x squared um, plus or minus uh, the limit of, um, oh, just 3, yeah, as x approaches c. All right, so that was the sum and the difference rule. Let's keep going. Uh, for the limit of x cubed, this is um, the power rule. So the power rule says that I can do the limit of, oh, that came out sloppy. Hold on just a second. There we go. Uh, the limit of x as x approaches c and then that raised to the power of 3, that's the power rule, plus, um, I'm going to do two rules at once here, um, I'm going to use the constant multiple rule to bring the 4 out, and then I will also use the power rule to say the limit as x approaches c of x, and then squared. And then we already talked about this limit. This is the limit of the constant function, right? 3 is a constant function. So the function values are always 3. Regardless of what um, value the x, uh, x is approaching, it doesn't really matter. The function values are always going to be 3. This is a constant function, so this is 3. Okay, I can make that a little nicer. Hold on just a second. Okay. Okay, there. It took me a long time just to write that neater. All right, here we go. This here is the identity function. Remember the identity function? So the limit of the identity function as x approaches c is simply c, and this is being cubed. Plus, this is the identity function again. So then this is 4 times c squared minus 3. So what I would like you to um, realize is that the limit of our polynomial function is basically our function evaluated at C. If we would have just, now this is the shortcut that, have, that we will make in the future. If we have a polynomial function, and we want to find the limit of a polynomial function, you can use the technique of direct substitution. In other words, just plug c in, and that's your limit. c cubed plus 4c squared minus 3. That's what we got. All right, now we're going to take or find the limit of a rational function. All right, so this is very important that you and I understand that we are finding the limit of a rational function. All right, so let's do it. The first rule um, that, um, that I would suggest we use is the quotient rule. Now, the quotient rule says that the limit of this quotient is equivalent to the quotient of the limit. Uh, of the limits. So I'm going to say the limit of the numerator, of course, as x approaches c, right, over or divided by the limit of the denominator. Um, to be, uh, to have proper notation, we should have parentheses around the expression uh, for which we're finding the limit. All right, so now what I'll do is something similar to the previous. I'll use the sum and difference rules for this numerator to say this is the limit of x to the fourth plus the limit of x squared minus uh, the limit of uh, 1. Okay, that's the number 1. Let me write it like this. Um, of course, this is all as x approaches c. Let's not lose that. Okay, as x approaches c. So this was the sum and difference rules. Um, the, the denominator, the limit of x squared plus the limit of 5. Again, as x approaches c. All right, the next rules, um, uh, the, the next set of rules that I think I'll use, let me move up as well because uh, I'm running out of space here. 
uh, let's see, for the numerator, I'll use the power rule. So this is equivalent to, in the numerator, uh, the limit of just x as x approaches c raised to the power of 4. Similarly, this is the limit of just x as x approaches c raised to the power of 2 minus, now this is the constant function, the limit of 1 as x approaches c is 1 over, um, let's see, the limit of x as x approaches c squared plus just 5 because that's the constant um, function. Okay, um, again, let me move up if you'll allow me um, to. So now this is equal to, now this is the limit fun, uh, excuse me, this is the identity function. This so is this, and so is this. And so we already talked about how this is going to be c to the fourth power plus c squared minus 1 over c squared plus 5. This is the limit. Now, here's the point I would like to make, and I'm sure you see it as well. The limit for this rational function is basically the rational function evaluated at C. Let me scroll back up here, show you the original function again. There it is. If we would have just plugged C in, in other words, if we would have just evaluated our rational function at C, that is to say, if we would have used direct substitution, you and, I, you and I would have been able to go around all of this work and and find the limit. So notice that for polynomial and rational functions, the previous problem was a, a previous function was polynomial. This function is rational. For each of these functions, we're finding that the limit is basically found by just using direct substitution. Cool. Let's look at another function. Okay, the last function I'm going to have us look at is the square root function. So let's see if we can use some of our limit laws to evaluate this limit. This time it's the limit as x approaches negative 2, an actual uh, an actual real number value, okay? All right, cool. So what we can do first is use the root rule. Um, your root is 2, right? You're finding a square root. Uh, so n is uh, 2. n is the, the index, and the root is a square root. Okay, anyway, so this is equivalent to the square root of the limit of 4x squared minus 3, um, of course, as x approaches negative 2. Now, what we're going to be able to say, um, I mean, in just a minute is, and I, I already alluded to it um, earlier, um, this is polynomial. And whenever we have a polynomial function, we're able to plug this number just straight into our function to evaluate the limit. In other words, when we have a polynomial function, for which we're finding the limit, we can use direct substitution. Um, but we haven't actually written that down yet, so I'm going to continue using the limit laws until I have that formally written down for us. All right, so what I'm going to do next then is use the sum and difference, or actually the difference uh, law, to say that this is equivalent to the limit of 4x squared minus the limit of 3 as x approaches negative 2. And um, this is equivalent to the limit of, well, I'm going to say 4 times the limit of x um, squared as x approaches negative 2. I wrote that a little more sloppy than I wanted to. I apologize for that. Minus, and then this is just the identity function. So you and I already know that this is 3. So then this is equal to the square root of 4 times, and this is the identity function. Um, I, I want to make sure I said it right. I, I hope I said this is the constant function. 
I hope I said that earlier, uh, the constant function, so it's just 3. This is the identity function, um, so then this is just going to be negative 2. Don't forget that this is being squared, so it'll be negative 2 and then squared and then minus 3. So all of this is equal to, you know, 2 squared is 4, 4 times 4 is 16, 16 minus 3 is 13, so the limit is the square root of 13. All right, here it is, evaluating limits of polynomials and rational functions. If we have a polynomial function, this is just the formal definition for a polynomial function, where n is some uh, whole number, right? Um, and um, this is your constant term, and a sub n is your leading coefficient, and a sub n is not zero. Anyway, this is a polynomial function. Then the limit of your polynomial function as x approaches c is simply p of c. In other words, you can use direct substitution when evaluating the limit of a polynomial function. This is huge, folks. This saves us so much time. So remember, if we're ever finding the limit of a polynomial function, if it's polynomial, then just go ahead and use direct substitution. Now, when it comes to rational functions, like we saw in a previous example, um, of course, a rational function is defined as a quotient of two polynomial functions. Uh, we can use direct substitution as well. So the limit of a rational function is simply that rational function evaluated at C as long as the denominator is not zero, the Q of C, as long as um, Q of C is not zero, then you can do this. Then you can use direct substitution. Okay, now we're going to look at um, a few examples of this where um, where the denominator is zero, you know what I mean? And so you're going to have to you're going to have to manipulate your function so that you are not dividing by zero, you know, because when you divide by zero, you know, you're undefined, right? And so there where you and I are going to have to work around that sometime. So we'll we'll look at um, an example of that in just a second. So when we find a limit like this, this is the limit of a rational function. And so what we can do is we can use direct substitution as long as when I plug negative one in, the denominator is not zero, and it's not. So because the denominator is non-zero at x equal to negative one, I can go ahead and plug that in, okay? So just be careful. So I'm gonna go ahead and evaluate this by just plugging negative one in, evaluating my rational function at negative one. So you see me evaluating my function at negative one. And if you simplify all of this, you get zero in the numerator, which is fine, and you get six in the denominator. So the limit is zero. As x approaches negative one, the function values are approaching zero. Okay, so graphically speaking, if you were to graph this function, folks, you would see on the graph that as x values approach negative one from both sides of negative one, your function values are approaching zero. In other words, your function values are approaching the x-axis. Okay. All right, we are being asked to find the limit, again, of a uh, rational function this time as x approaches 1. Now notice that um, the, well, both the numerator and the denominator factor. So the limit of this function is equivalent to the limit of, let's see, the numerator would be x plus 2 times x minus 1. The denominator would be x times x minus 1. All right, and so notice that we are not allowed to use direct substitution here because if we do, the denominator is zero and the function is undefined. Plug one in, you get one minus one, you get zero here as this factor, which makes the entire denominator zero, so you cannot plug one in. 
However, we can actually divide out these common factors, right? We can actually eliminate a factor of x minus 1. So this function is equivalent to the function here, uh, x plus 2 over x, as long as x is not 1, right, everybody? And so um, you know from your studies in algebra that the graph of this rational function is equivalent to the graph of the original function as long as x is not 1, right? In other words, you have a hole in the graph there at x equal to 1. So um, the this expression here is equivalent to this one. Therefore, the limit of this function will be equivalent to the limit of this function because the expressions are equivalent. So now I can use direct substitution because this denominator is no longer 0 when I let x be 1. So now you're going to see me just Oh, use direct substitution. So then this is 3 over 1. The limit is 3. Again, graphically speaking, if you were to graph this function, you would see that as x values approach 1 from both sides of 1, your function values are approaching 3. Now, we do know that um, our function is undefined at 1, but although the function is undefined at 1, the limit as x approaches 1 still exists, and it is equal to 3. Just in case you're more of a visual learner, like a lot of us are, this is the graph of our function. If you took the time to graph it, um, you don't have to graph it to find the limit, but um, just as a visual, this is what the, the graph does look like. Um, and so you can see, you can confirm what we found analytically. You can confirm, uh, the, the, the graphical representation confirms what you and I found analytically. As x values approach 1 from both sides of 1, your function values are approaching uh, 3, Okay, which, which is what you and I found. Very good. Look at this expression. The square root of x squared plus 100 minus 10 all over x squared. And we're finding the limit as x approaches 0. Now, we cannot use direct substitution here. Um, the numerator, after all, is not a polynomial. Uh, the denominator is. But the numerator is not because of the square root. The square root is a power of one half, and one half is not an integer. It's not a positive integer, and so this numerator is not a polynomial function, uh, which means this is not a rational function. And um, um, even if it were a rational function, you cannot plug zero in because the denominator would be zero, and the whole expression would be undefined. Um, one thing, uh, just a side note, really quickly. I don't want anyone thinking that. You know, the square root of x squared plus 100, you do see a sum of two squares here. I don't want anyone to say that this is equal to uh, the square root of x squared plus the square root of 100. Like like, like as if the, the square root of the sum of two squares is equivalent to the sum of the square roots of the perfect squares, right? Um, the square root of a sum is equivalent to the sum of square roots. Um, that cannot be true because um, this would be x plus 10, right? Um, and that's not true. And I could give you an example. If this were true, then um, let me see. What would be a good example? Um, oh, this would be a good example. What about the square root of 9 plus 4? This is a sum of two perfect squares. And so if I were able to just evaluate uh, it like this, like the sum of the square roots. The right-hand side is 3 plus 2. The right-hand side is 5, while the left-hand side, using the order of operations, is the square root of 13. And you and I know that the square root of 13 
is a little bit greater than 3, but less than 4. So this is some irrational number between 3 and 4. And the right-hand side is 5. So this is clearly not equal, right? And so just be careful. You're not allowed to say the square root of x squared plus 100 is simply x plus 10. That's just not true. I just didn't know if anybody was um, thinking about doing that. So, all right, here's um, the technique that you and I are going to uh, use here. And it's going to be a great technique. It's going to be a popular technique. All right, so here's our technique. We're going to multiply this expression by 1. It's important that we multiply by 1 so that we don't change the value of the expression. You and I already know that whenever you take any expression, you multiply by 1 it does not change the value of your expression, right? You get the same expression back. So that is to say, you know, a lot of students say, whatever you do to the top, you got to do to the bottom, or whatever you do to the bottom, you got to do to the top. And that's the reason is so that you're really multiplying by one and not changing the value of the expression. Now, what we will do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same thing, by the same expression, and that is the conjugate radical expression of the numerator. Now, the conjugate radical expression of the numerator, the conjugate only changes the operation. That's the only thing it changes. So instead of subtraction, you'll see addition. So notice that the only thing different between the original numerator and this expression is the operation. So subtraction turned to addition. This here is called the conjugate of this numerator. Notice that we're multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same expression. That way we're multiplying by one. All right, so let's do it. This turns out to be the limit as x approaches zero, right? Um, notice that um, the square root times this square root um, gives us only the radicand. So then we just have x squared plus 100. And then notice that this product, 10 times the square root of x squared plus 100, is the opposite of negative 10 times the square root of x squared plus 100. So those two products will cancel. And then uh, negative 10 and positive 10 give you a product of negative 100. And then the denominator, I'll keep it in, I'll keep this in, um, let's see, uh, factored form. So x squared times this conjugate expression. So let me write it like this. There. Um, of course, let's simplify the numerator. So this turns out to be the limit of just x squared in the numerator over x squared times this radical expression, uh, times this conjugate expression is what I meant to say. Okay, of course, as x approaches 0. All right, notice what multiplying by the conjugate allowed us to do. Watch this. x squared divides out with x squared. And so now... I'm going to move up the screen here. Now we have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x squared plus 100 uh, plus 10. And the great thing about this is that now the denominator is no longer 0 when we um, consider x to be 0, right? Um, the denominator is non-zero, so now we can actually evaluate this limit. Um, so let's actually substitute here. And so this is 1 over the square root of 0 squared plus 100 plus 10. Oops, that's really sloppy. Hold on. Plus 10. Okay, and of course we're using the uh, the quotient rule here. Uh, the limit of just the constant is just one, right? Um, and then we can use the root rule and the power rule here um, to actually evaluate this limit. And so we have one over 
uh, the square root, square root of 100 is just 10. 10 plus 10 is 20. So the answer is 1 over 20. If you want it as a decimal, 0 0.05 if you prefer a decimal. So look how we were able to evaluate the limit by multiplying by the conjugate. That is going to be a technique that's really popular for us. So make sure you keep that technique um, handy. Now the last part of our lesson um, will be about the sandwich theorem, which is also called the squeeze or the pinching theorem. And this theorem um, helps us calculate a variety of limits. Um, it's called the squeeze or the sandwich theorem because it refers to a function, I called it here, f, here this function f, um, that's like sandwiched, if you will, sandwiched between the values of two other functions. I call them g and h here. Um, and they have the same limit l at a point, call it c. So being trapped between the values of the other two functions, that approach, um, that have the same limit l, right? Uh, both h and g have limit l as x approaches some number c. So then f must also have that same limit l. That's what it's saying. But this is the formal language. Suppose that g of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. So you can see f of x, these function values, are trapped between or sandwiched between uh, the function values for g and the function values for h for all x in some open interval containing c, except possibly at c itself. Suppose also that the limit of g and the limit of h as x approaches c is l. So that's what the picture denotes, that the limit of h and the limit of g is l as x approaches some number c. Then the limit of f of x is also going to be l. This theorem is going to be very important for us. It's going to help us find, um, like I said, a, a wide range of, of different kinds of limits. Let's look at this example. So given a function u that satisfies uh, that u of x is between 1 minus x squared over 4 and 1 plus x squared over 2, find the limit of this function u as x approaches 0 no matter how complicated u is. So we're not even given, given an expression that defines u. We just know that u, the function values for u, are between, right, sandwiched between the function values of 1 minus x squared over 4 and 1 plus x squared over 4. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the limit of each of these expressions um, as x approaches 0. Now the limit of 1 minus x squared over 4 as x approaches 0 is becoming, you know, x is, is, is approaching 0. So this is becoming 1 minus 0 squared over 4, which is just equal to 1. Likewise, the limit of 1 plus x squared over 2 as x approaches 0 is equal to 1 plus you know, 0 squared over 2, which is, again, just equal to uh, 1, okay? So that means the, the limit of u of, u of x, uh, because its function values are sandwiched between the function values for these two expressions, the limit of u of x as x approaches 0 must also be 1. So here's one example of how the sandwich theorem helps us find some limits. Let's look at some more. Now what's really important is that the sandwich theorem helps us establish um, these important limits here. The limit of sine of theta as theta approaches zero is zero, and also the limit of cosine of theta as theta approaches zero is equal to one. You're gonna wanna remember these, these um, these limits are going to be very important as we proceed through um, our, our studies.